Okay, my charge when Dan called was, quote, do anything I wanted to do. So we'll look at judges. We'll do an overview because I like continuity. Dan will come back in next week and he'll, he'll probably hit some of the same things, but we'll go with it and we'll, we'll kind of talk about it in general terms. We'll do an overview of the book and the circumstances for what we're seeing as far as the story of the Israelites go. Um, who wrote it, do you know? Do we know? We don't really know. Samuel probably wrote it. Uh, it's not definite, but probably. The time frame was about 1000 BC, give or take, as accurate as you can be with those kind of things. And the period of the judges was about 300 years. Now, that's the period of the judges, not just the period of the book of judges. So we've got how many judges? Do we remember? Somebody blurted it out. 15. 15. Betty Sanders gets a donut. 15. <laughs> um, 13 of the 15 are talked about in the book of Judges. The two that would not be would be Eli and Samuel. So we go through and we learn all their names and we see their exploits. And some of them are talked about in just a verse or two. And it, it can be a little bit confusing going through the book because the chronology is not perfect. Um, you can have situations where there's a judge talked about and it might say that uh, he judged for X years and there was peace in the land and that's all it says about him. And you can have other circumstances where there is a judge who didn't judge for very long and there can be verses and chapters dedicated to the story of, of his exploits. Judges also were... Well, let me back up. To understand the book of Judges, we've got to know what came before. We've got to understand the past. And what did we just get through with regarding leadership of the Israelites? Before Joshua, Moses coming out of, out of Egypt, right? So what do we have when we're looking at leadership? How do the Israelites react to their leader? One person in charge overseeing the entire exodus, the wandering in the wilderness, and all those things until we get ready to actually cross over Jordan. From that point, where do we go? One, one person, again, Joshua, in charge, a military strategist, a general, knows how to fight those battles and win them, of course, with God's help. Then what happens? We're just kind of there, aren't we? We've got a whole bunch of people in charge. We've got judges. They run from one to the next to the next. They, they, um, there may be, have been times when there was not a judge who was directly in charge. There may have been other times when judges overlapped. Reading the book of Judges... Don't get in the idea that when you start at the first, you end at the last, that we necessarily went straight through all the period. Okay? So if we've got 300 or so years and we've got 15 judges and you do the math, if they each serve 20 years apiece, then we could bridge the gap, could we not? If I did that right. 15 times something equals 300. So they wouldn't have to judge that long. But many judged longer, many judged less time, so on and so forth. So there's several men in different places who led Israel. What else is unique? Or di well, I don't want to say unique. What else is different from the, the, from the Israelite sojournings that we saw with Moses as they left Egypt and with Joshua? Got any thoughts? Think geographically. What happened at the end of Joshua's life? What was split up? Divided up? 
where had they been prior? And even though they were still in tribes, were they... I got... Y'all hearing it? Feedback? I'm whistling. And my hearing aids are turned down. Still got it. All right. No, now it's back. All right. Is it bothering y'all? It's bothering me. Um, We had all the Israelites in one place. They were in the wilderness, but as a group, where were they? Kind of all camped together in different spots around the tabernacle, etc., and all that kind of stuff. What happens when we get, as they've crossed the Jordan, as they've gone into the promised land, as they've won battles and battles and battles, and they've been promised different places... And then we get to the end of Joshua's, or towards the end of Joshua's life, what happens? They start going out. They start separating. So we had a small group, ideal for leadership of one person. Now we've got a big group. I should say we had a big group in a small place. Now we've got a big group in a bunch of places. So that that in itself is a little bit different as we go from the period of, of Moses and Joshua and on into uh, the period of the Judges. And the book of Judges itself takes us into what I've seen termed as the dark ages of the Jews. Because what do we see in this period of Judges repeatedly happening? Falling away, sin, idolatry, and all these things that go with that. And so there's, there's some difficult times. They sin, they fall away. Guys, I got whistling, and I can't get it out of my ears. And I'm, I'm not trying to be a prima donna, but, a prima donna, but it's bugging me. I, I don't know. Are y'all hearing it? Have y'all ever done that thing where you get the tone on the iPhone, and you try to hear it, and if you're old, you can't hear the tones? You know what I'm talking about? We are going somewhere in the car one day, and Matthew handed me that. I said, can you hear this? I said, hear what? He said, oh, come on, Dad, a 40-year-old can hear that tone. It says so right here. (laughs) Wrong. Huh? It's better right now. I'm not hearing it. Wasn't hearing it. Now I hear it again. (laughs) All right. um, Where was I? I was talking about tones and being deaf. The con- thank you, Brad. The constant sin and, and going into captivity and being uh, oppressed by the people. Think about the story of Gideon. Why was that important? What happened during that period of time? Who was oppressing the Israelites? The Midianites. All right? They're kind of running roughshod over the Israelites. God raises up Gideon in order to correct that problem. And that's what we see happening throughout the book of Judges. Look back, and and to really understand the book of Judges, we have to look back. We have to look at um, the latter part of Joshua, and we have to look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 first. Go there with me. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Instructions that the Israelites had long before where we are in Judges. Okay? When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. What's the history that we know of the Israelites? Did they do that? How many times did they ignore that direct command from God as to how to go about the business in in taking their territory once they crossed over the River Jordan. They'd do it for a while. They'd slack off. They would make treaties. 
they would intermarry, what would happen when they, do, when they would do that? Problems and problems and problems and problems. They had an instruction, they didn't follow it, and they reaped from it constantly. Now we get into Joshua, look in the 24th chapter of Joshua. Because as we go about this, <clears throat> we can't truly understand Judges without understanding this charge that Joshua gave the people. We know what happens just a couple of chapters later in Judges. We'll get to that in just a minute. But what had Joshua done the entirety of his life? Who went on the mountaintop? Boy, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Who went part of the way up the mountain with Moses? Joshua had been Moses' protege from day one. He knew how to lead. He had watched Moses. He, was, he communed with God. He understood what it was to get, out of the, or to get out of Egypt. And he was a natural leader. He was one of the twelve that went into the promised land and said what? We can do this. That we can do this. One or two, Joshua and Caleb, out of 12 total. And so we get into the book, and just recapping some of the things. The first thing that happens when the Israelites cross the Jordan, where are they going? What battle? You know, it's not a trick question. Jericho. How many swords, spears, catapults, Bows, arrows, how many of those were used in the battle of Jericho? And the weapons were what? Trumpets and clay pots, wasn't it? Am I remembering? Or y'all tell me. Did I just mess that up? Didn't they have pans? I'm sorry, not clay pots. Didn't they have pans also? Hmm? They just shouted? All right, they blew the trumpets, shouted. What happened to the walls? If you were an Israelite and you were following Joshua and you went and saw this example of leadership regarding this battle, when you marched around the city of Jericho one time a day for six days and seven times a day on, seven times on the seventh day, as we started the week, what would you think of Joshua? Pardon, Jerry? <laughs> yeah. Jerry indicates that he, he might have thought that Joshua was nuts. Perhaps. What about when we followed it up on the second day? What about the third, the fourth, the fifth, and so on? What happens when we blow those trumpets finally and the walls come down? Do you think that there were some people who stepped back and recognized that Joshua was talking directly to God. Now from that point forward, would you have followed Joshua? I know I would have, because I would have recognized just exactly the power that Joshua had access to. God had made a promise, had He not? Told Him what He was going to do, told them that he was going to drive out all those people. They had one job to do in order to hold up their end of the bargain. If they would do their thing, God would do his thing. And they shouldn't have doubted him after the, the battle of Jericho. Now, remember a guy named Achan comes up next, makes a mistake. Um, anyway, that's, those things happen. But throughout Joshua's um, life, he led. And he led with honor, and he got all the things done. Joshua comes to the end of his life. He's up on the mountaintop, and he's addressing the Israelites. He's going to ask them the same question 
three times. What is the question? Are you going to follow God? They all say yes. Turn to the 24th chapter of Joshua. And starting with verse 11, and it might be a little bit lengthy, but uh, it's worth the read. Because Joshua is going to tell them, here's what you have done. Here's what is to be done. Starting with verse 11. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. All those people that we just read about in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you had been standing in Joshua's place, would you have given the people a choice? Or would you have said, let's go people, this is what we're going to do? How well does it work out sometimes when we give our kids choices? You know, it, it's, it's one of those things at times then, yeah, it may work, but there are many times when you just got to make a decision and go with it because you're the adult. You're the parent, they're the child, and you know what's best, really. Not just saying that. But even having said that, what does work better when the child is a willing participant in whatever we're going to try to go do and the child understands what the purpose is and et cetera and so on? What did, the, what did Joshua understand here? That if he did not have a willing group, if God didn't have a volunteer army, they weren't going to get very far. And he was trying to weed out those who were going to be troublemakers on the front end. Look, if you don't want to do this, if you would rather serve Baal, go serve Baal. If you don't want to do that, then serve God. What middle ground did Joshua identify? He was serving God no matter what. Betty says he was serving God no matter what. Was there a middle ground? I gotta have less, less volume. Please. That thing's drilling right through my head. Man. There was no middle ground. There absolutely, positively was either you were with God or you were with not. And that's what should have taken place. What did the Israelites say? Verse 16, So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. That's the first time. What did they say? We will not serve other gods. Joshua asked the question again. It, when dealing with your kids, have you ever asked the question three times? Multiple times? This is what I said. This is what we're going to do. Do you agree? Yes, Dad, I agree. Let me ask you one more time, son. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is He who brought us up and our fathers from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and amongst all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land 
we will also serve the Lord, for He is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you after He has done you good. You understand what's happening there? Joshua is basically telling them, Do not answer me in haste. Don't tell me what you think I want you to say. you got to be sure that you tell me what's in your heart. How did they answer him? And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. My version has an exclamation point after it. That's number two answer. So Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord for yourself to serve Him. And they all said, We are witnesses. Again, exclamation point. Now therefore, he said, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and His voice we will obey. Third time, affirmative response. The answer Joshua got was that they will do what? They will not forsake God. We know the rest of the story, don't we? Because what did they do? Verse 25, So Joshua made a covenant, a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and he took a large stone and he set it there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. So Joshua, skipping a couple of verses, then led the people to their inheritance. What happens two chapters later? Chapter 2. There arose a generation that knew not God. Why? How did it happen? Does anybody know a real economist? Have you ever sat in a seminar with a real live economist? You don't want to. Because if there's anybody that was ever gloom and doom, it's an economist. You know, I enjoyed economy when, or economics when I was in college. Macro and micro. I thought it was a good class. It taught me a lot. I understood it. And I'll never forget the first time I ever went to a continuing education class and an economist had a half a day of that class. And I thought I was going to come out of my skin. I've never heard so much gloom and doom in my life. And that's all it was. And that was 40 years ago. And guess what? The message has not changed. If you have some dear friends who are economists, I don't necessarily think badly of them. I just don't want to hear their message. But yet, here we stand today, and just like one of those economists, I'm preaching the gloom and doom of this generation that knew not God, because where do we stand today? In the 21st century, or whatever century we're in, have we gotten to a point where we're scratching our heads going, wait a minute, that could very well be us. What has happened? Do you think they also said this a hundred years ago? <laughs> and we'll be saying it a hundred years from now. You know, I take great solace in the fact that Abraham bargained with God to find ten faithful people in Sodom and Gomorrah. There's more than ten of us in here tonight. All right? So we're good? You know, you would think. But as we look around in our world today, are we to the point where we have forgotten God. It sure seems like it, doesn't it? How did, the, how did the Israelites get there? And this is what the book of Judges is about. As we go into that period where nobody paid attention to God. Something we can learn and apply in our lives today. How did they get to that point? How, how was the word, how were the commandments in God's words taught communicated 
carried on in that particular time. Morris? I'm going to sum up uh, Morse's comments. Is, uh, comments are excellent. I'm going to assume everybody in here could hear most of that. I'll sum it up for the internet crowd. And the answer to the question was, whose responsibility was it to teach all these Israelites? It was their parents' responsibility. It's still our parents. It's, it's our responsibility today. It was my parents' responsibility. Now it's mine. Or then it became mine. Now it's my children's responsibility to teach their children. How did Joshua, how did the, the typical Israelite family get the word out in those days? Plug in the iPad, turn on the television, watch search on Sunday mornings, do whatever. They sat down as a unit and they talked about it. That's the way it spread. What was the failure between the end of Joshua and the second chapter of Judges? What was the failure? The failure was specifically and directly the family unit's failure to teach, to preach, to make sure that God was put forth to the family on a regular basis. And so you, you want to throw some stones or cast some responsibility upon the Levites. Look back at the time that the Israelites were in Egypt. I'm sorry, in the wilderness after having come out of Egypt. What was the responsibility of the Levites? Was it to lead worship or to facilitate worship? Who, where did God put the responsibility to the Israelites to start worship? It was within the family. Now, were there certain high days? Yes. Were there certain memorials and feasts? Absolutely. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it was not the Levite's job to go door-to-door -door saying, have you read your memory verses today? The Levite's job was to sit back at the tabernacle and be a butcher and carry carcasses to the fire and to make sure things were done in a proper way and a lot of other things, manual labor that we don't really think about in terms of what the Levite's job was. The Israelites failed in this regard. Is there something to learn there? Absolutely there is. And that's what we're reading about in this book of Judges. Because we've got to get this span that takes us this 300 years from when we didn't have the one single leader to a period when we had what? What comes after the Judges? Kings. We're spanning that gap. Where did the Judges start, by the way? Where did they come from? How did they come about? Pardon? What, what happened when Moses' father-in-law came to visit? Moses was working himself to death, and he suggested that he get judges to, to handle small groups and work their way up to larger groups and take some of the burden off of him because if he didn't, he was going to burn himself out. That system of judges started there. And now we get down the road and we get to a system whereby those judges, key judges, are going to be in charge of things and going to deal with 
pulling Israel back to God after periods of, of backsliding. Go to Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 9. I'm sorry, starting in verse 7. Judges chapter 2, verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath, Heres, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gosh. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, who? When all that generation, what generation? When all the people that knew Joshua died, that generation had all been carried to their fathers. Is it uncommon for someone to, who sees something to have a different level of belief than someone who hears about it? Have you seen that? Yeah. What did these people see? They were there when Joshua led. What did they see? They saw the exploits of the Israelites. They saw the battles. They saw the the enemies defeated. Does it make it any less real? The fact that we're 2,000 years from Jesus Christ, does it make any less real His crucifixion and then later His resurrection? Is it sometimes harder for us to believe it? I don't know that it is for me, but you see how some people are. Because what is a natural tendency when you become further removed from a situation? You tend to not consider it as important. Back to verse 10. When that generation had been gathered to their fathers, dead, gone, died, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which He had done in Israel. I'm sorry, done for Israel. Now, from the time I was old enough to remember a Bible lesson, I have had that verse read to me, and I, the question has been, or the, the statement has been put, the church of the Lord is only one generation away from apostasy. If I've heard that once, I've heard it several times. And we know it to be true, right? Because we see it here. And this book of Judges is going to give us example after example how they slid back. They went into, if not captivity, and at least they were mistreated by other nations. And then a judge would rise up, take charge of things. For example, Gideon. And then what would happen? They would fall back again. This is a horrible, horrible indictment on the Israelites. This is an indictment on us today in the church if we don't handle our own business with our own family. Do things always work out the way they're supposed to? Do people have free will? Can our children that we brought to Bible class and we taught and all those kind of things make a decision to do otherwise? Yes, they can. Is that an indictment upon us as a parent? Well, if we did our job, no, it's not. Because their children make decisions. People make decisions. But you get the distinct impression here that there arose a generation that knew not God. We're being told there arose a generation that was not taught God. Now that, we will be indicted for. You know, people from the outside looking in see my three sons and, they, and they, they'll say something like, you have wonderful boys. And I'll say, thank you, I appreciate that. And I do appreciate it. But what do they not know? 
They don't know all the mess ups. <laughs> they don't know all the times that the door's been shut behind them and they've been sent out, you know, on the street, told not to come back, all those kind of things. How many times they've been brought home by the sheriff's department or whatever the other case might be. And all the things that you've dealt with as a parent when you have kids. But if I have a prayer for leadership of my family, what is that prayer? That I'm consistent, that I teach, that I am a leader, that I'm a father and all those things, that I am a Christian leader and father and all those things. And that's, what's hap that's what didn't happen here. Now, turn to Judges chapter 17, 6. Because as we look at this and we think about these dark times for the Israelites. We, we look at this section here, there arose a generation that knew not God. <clears throat> this sums it up nicely towards the end of the chapter. Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, if you'll turn to the very last verse in the book of Judges, you'll see the same thing repeated over again. Two times. There was no king, and everyone did what was right in whose eyes? Their own eyes. Do we understand that that's moral relativism? Do we understand that that's looking at God and saying, we don't believe that you are the one true God. We don't believe that there's a standard. We'll go with what feels right. What was the saying back in the 60s that came out of Woodstock? I wasn't old enough to go to Woodstock, thankfully. If it feels good, do it. Remember that? And it may not have come from Woodstock, but it was from back there somewhere where the hippies were. Um, that's what this is talking about. They didn't know God. There was a time in which there was no leadership and they did what was right in their own eyes. Period. End of the story. Heather. Well, Heather's comment is um, about those who would play church, who would be here on Wednesdays and Sundays, but not live it the rest of the days. And isn't that what Joshua was telling the people when he made the speech on the mountaintop? He said, you're either with me or against me. You're either with God or you're not. If you want to go choose, serve the idols, then go do it. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, Heather also made a comment about I, what I interpret to be a guilty feeling if, if something happens and you feel like you didn't do your job or what you could have done to prevent it. I can tell you very candidly, speaking just me as a parent, and I know Debbie will agree with me when I tell you that I believe I did a good job as a parent, but sometimes my kids are idiots. Plain and simple. Now, I'm not talking about them in, you know, specifically. You know what I'm talking about as a parent. We, we do the best job that we can, and they make a decision that's just wrong. It happens. You know, there's a scripture that says something about teaching your children the way of God, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. If you change the emphasis on that, when they are old, 
you put the emphasis there, if you provide the right foundation, there's a chance they'll come back. What happened to the prodigal son? He was taught right. He made a bad choice. What did he do later when he came, when he came around, when he came to his senses? And where was his father? Looking out for him and saw him coming from a distance. And so the Israelites made bad decisions. I've made a few bad decisions. My kiddos have made a few bad decisions. But we have a lot of prayer and we have faith in God. Uh, it'll come back. Things will turn around. Now, <clears throat> we go through this period of judges in order to bridge us over to the kings. Do you remember what God told Samuel about the kings? About the people wanting a king? Pardon? You have one king, God. And, and do we get the impression that Samuel might have taken it a little bit personal, that the people wanted a king and weren't satisfied with the, the job that he was doing? Because God told Samuel, uh, well, Jerry's comment was, you have one king, that's God. And that's correct. He also told Samuel, don't worry about it. The people want it. I, I've planned for it. I'm going to take care of it. It's not because you did a bad job. And so we go through the book of Judges with a lot of these judges. We don't really talk about Eli and Samuel. We get to that later. And that's that whole 300-year time span I talked about. And then kind of as a sidebar also, what's the book after Judges? Ruth? What is Ruth about? Ruth is a separate book, is it not? It's got its own title, right? But what's, on, what's, what's Ruth 1-1? One, one? What does it tell you about the time frame of the book? Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So when did the action in Ruth take place? During this period of the judges. What do we have in the book of Judges? We have largely a negative story. Do we not? A lot of gloom and doom like those thinking economists I talked about. What do we have after the book of Judges? We've got a bad story. How do we follow it up? The book of Ruth could be an appendix to the book of Judges. What do we see in the book of Ruth? Through all these bad things that have happened, through all these times when the Israelites have fallen away, come back, fallen away again, come back, fallen away, what story does God give us after this book to let us know about the hope of the Israelites. He gives us a beautiful story about a, a, a mother-in-law and her daughter in the lineage of David and therefore the lineage of Jesus Christ in four chapters or how, not many chapters there are in the book of Ruth. You wonder sometimes why things are put where they're put, what the wisdom of God is when you're looking at the Scripture. Here we've got... I was about to say it. I think it's 21 chapters. What is it? We've got 21 chapters of gloom and doom. We're following it with the book of Ruth with a wonderful story about it. even though they've done these things, guess who I am? God who's never turned His back on my people. All right, in a nutshell, that's kind of an introduction to the book of Judges. Do you have... Uh, comments or questions that you want to ask or talk about with a minute or so that we have left? Now that the ringing in my ears has subsided, I apologize for my actions tonight. I cannot tell you what that I was hearing up here. It was, it was like, like driving a nail right through this eardrum and out this eardrum. No, co no comments or questions? Thank you very much. Dan will pick up with the first chapter of Judges next week.